Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee is the president and CEO of the National Association for Multi-Ethnicity and Communications, NAMIC, and she's done a lot of work with the One Economy. So I'm just shortening it since we've done it once, but Nicole? There she is, okay, great, thanks. Good morning, everybody. It's always good to go after Fred, because then I can figure out how to temper my remarks <laughs> and figure out what he's gonna say. Um, I wanna thank the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee for inviting me here today and for organizing this. Um, I had a prior role in public policy more intricately, and I'm always um, excited to come and speak about issues related to what we're gonna be talking about today during the conference. Um, for many of us in this room, the conversation that we'll have this morning and what you'll have throughout the day is not foreign to us, and nor will it be a point that we all do not have a vested interest in. And as it was mentioned, I think, in the prior question, we are seeing the uh, president also take that into account. I tell people I was very excited, the State of the Union, when I heard the first time he mentioned broadband. <laughs> I think I called all my friends like he just mentioned broadband because many of us have been kicking at the door to ensure that is an inclusive part of our political, civic, and economic ecosystem. So what I wanted to talk about today in these comments around State of the Net is just to talk about how do you wrap around this, these discussions that we've been having about bigger and bolder broadband, and how do we use that to leverage what we need to do as a nation going forward? So in preparation, I actually grabbed an article that Chairman Jenikowski actually wrote for the CIO Network, where he mentioned that the US is in need of a bigger boat. Now, for those of us who know the chairman, that was an interesting analogy, right? But what does that mean to have a bigger boat when it comes to broadband? And by that he meant that the U.S. is in a race to have super fast, high capacity, ubiquitous broadband networks delivering speeds, and this is quote unquote, measuring in gigabytes, not megabytes, to ensure that not just consumer convenience, but also economic growth, job creation, and U.S. competitiveness. And inherent, I think, in those remarks, and I'll get to three points that I'll share today, is this conversation about the massive infrastructure shift that I think is obviously gonna percolate some level of this innovation. And that's really where I wanna keep my remarks today. And I'm gonna share, I don't know about many of you, but I'm coming off of the heels of Inauguration Weekend, and I wanted to share as part of my remarks some exciting things that I actually saw that would be relevant to the conversations that we're having here. Broadband, my friends, and I think this is something that we often confuse, it's not broadband by itself, but it's broadband as a platform for innovation. And it's something that needs to be spurred because in this country, uh, we're leading the innovation trajectory, particularly when we think about what Apple has done with the iPhone and the iPad, when we think about Facebook, and my new best friend, Instagram. Still trying to learn how to use this. So I'm not going to tell you my age, <laughs> but there are some technology products that I'm just still getting, you know, I'm enthralled and amazed by the capacity of them. And one of the things that I think is important in terms of my first point is as a nation, as we think about the state of the net, yeah, it's good, but innovation is going to continue to outpace our existing broadband infrastructure. And I think that's an important point to make in the years that I've actually been in this business for you know, as an advocate to where I am today. When we think about the power of innovation, we will be disadvantaged as a country if we actually don't match that with the infrastructure that we're trying to build. So let me share my inauguration weekend stories. Hundreds of thousands of people crowded on the mall. How many of you in this room actually braved the cold weather and went out to the National Mall? Okay, you all were very, very brave. <laughs> Some of us had tickets. How many of you had tickets to functions throughout the inauguration like the parade? And then how many of you just stayed home <laughs> and watched it on TV? That wasn't me, but next four years I just might because it was kind of cold. And I was thinking about as I was watching this historic event because I braved the cold and took the metro down, downloaded the app to make sure I was actually ready to uh, figure out where I was going. I watched on the National Mall hundreds maybe hundreds of thousands of people take pictures, post it, send it to their Facebook, Instagram it, tweet it. Um, it was reported that Twitter's government and politics team, there were 1.1 million inauguration related tweets just happening over the weekend. Wherever you were in the country, 
you could share this historic moment with the people in your online community in real time. I had the privilege um, of watching, because I didn't go to the 2009 inauguration, of watching the parade nearby the presidential viewing station with my 10-year-old son. And I remember using my phone to text my mother to find out when the president had left the Capitol. We weren't super early, but we were early. So we were sitting there at least about 11 o'clock waiting for him to leave the Capitol to make his way down to the White House. And I just remember using my phone, emailing my mother, how far is he, did he leave? Because she was watching on TV. And as soon as they turned that corner, 15th and um, H, I leaned over to my son, I said, they're coming. He said, how do you know? I said, I just got an email <laughs> that they're on their way. As soon as the president and the first lady got out of the car, you could see all of the people with their cameras ready to take a picture. Now, I'm not dating myself, nor will I tell my age. I have a birthday coming up soon. But I haven't seen anything like that before. People standing up, camera phones. You know, back in the days when I was growing up, we had our digital video cameras <laughs> and our other cameras that we were trying to adjust that we couldn't put the telescope out far enough. But people were just, they were prepared for the president to come. And as soon as he and the first lady passed, all you could see were people posting. I mean, I went to my own folks' Facebook page and saw hundreds of posts. He just got sworn in. He just passed by. He just did this. And I thought to myself, and I share this story because I thought to myself, how did we do that? And I remember reading an article how they put extra cell towers across the lawn. Some of you may have known this, and some of you may not just to accommodate the mobile traffic that they expected on that day. And one of the reflections that I had as I was watching people socially engage with the internet is in a time of trouble, disaster, Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Katrina, are we also using the internet in that way? The, the disasters that we saw in New Orleans, the so close to disaster of what we saw in terms of communications breakdown in uh, New York City, and across the coast, could we occupy the same type of traffic on the current network infrastructure that we have? It's great when it's fun and you're smiling, but it's not when you can't reach out to your loved ones. And so I think this first point of ensuring that the innovation that we have continues to be accommodated by the network infrastructure that we are creating is important. We know in this country that we're deploying 4G wireless networks at a scale and rapidly increasing LTE subscribership. Second to none, we have the highest rate of US, household subscribe, US subscribers to LTE. We know that wired systems are passing the majority of homes, over 80% of, of homes in the US are offering the benefits now of wired services in bundles as well, telephone, television, what I call teleconnections to consumers. We know that more mobile apps are being developed to assist people in the search of just not consumer convenience, but also need, needed uh, benefits. Yet we have to free up available spectrum. So as you have this conversation today, discussing spectrum, discussing the capacity of the cloud, I think is very much important. We are upgrading our highway and roadways. We need to do the same thing with our communications protocol. My second point, to discuss the state of the net, we also need to form a more perfect union within the digital ecosystem. I have spent most of my life, um, I wasn't like Fred, I didn't get a science kid. In fact, I have a funny story with science because I have a six-year-old daughter who I put in the Legos program at school. She comes home, she says, Mommy, I'm the only girl. <laughs> and I said, that's okay, because <laughs> I had to play with dolls and you're going to play with Legos <laughs> and robotics. But So what Fred was talking about was very relevant, it hit a note. But the second thing, again, is that we have to form a more perfect union with this ecosystem. I spent many years when I was at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies and when I was at One Economy looking at the state of broadband adoption among minority communities. That was 10, 15 years ago when we were actually going door to door in the streets of San Francisco, Chicago, you name it, Miami, Florida, convincing low income people to move from public access centers to a PC in the home. Unfortunately, my friends, today that divide still exists. Even though we've made progress, 30% of people still remain offline and they're disproportionately low income, minority, and elderly. So again, they weren't, I had my 75 year old aunt with me at the viewing station. She could barely get her camera to open while everybody else had their flip, you know, their camera smartphones out. We have to address that digital divide to form a more perfect net. 
How can anybody in a household that does not have residential broadband access have their child complete a homework assignment, file their taxes online, in some cities and states apply for public benefits, and even overuse their public library system for information? Think about older citizens who do not have the exposure to these smartly programmed, intelligent phones their ability to transact business in cities and states that have had to close one-stop centers for the seniors, where are they actually gaining information? Even for far-reaching consequences of not having a broadband connection is getting a job. If you want to find a job these days, they're not posted on court boards or listed in classifieds. You have to find them on the internet. And with public libraries swelling in terms of their ability to meet the demand of consumers that come in every day, how do you find a job? Again, very important to the state of the net in terms of how it ties to the tools that we need to equip people for the next generation of our economy. In our industry, in the cable industry, uh, we've been very much involved with the Connect to Compete initiative. It was something that started out through uh, the merger that Comcast had with NBC, through the Internet Essentials Program. Over 100,000 families have been touched through a low-cost broadband solution, which is one of the prohibitive factors to low-income people and minorities. And that initiative is now widespread nationally. It's not called Internet Essentials anymore, my friends. It's called Connect to Compete in a very deliberate and strategic way to ensure that we're not leaving people behind. So again, my second point, we've got to create a state of the net that promotes inclusivity of all people, irregardless of where you are. And then finally, rapid innovation will require an investment in people. This is a new one for me because um, the National Association for Multi-Ethnicity and Communications, NAMIC for short, is all about tipping the needle towards diversity and inclusion in the media and communications industry. Most of my career, I've spent on the consumer side, and now I actually get to dabble on the strategic side of what our companies are doing to ensure diverse perspectives. And people are really important, and it's always interesting to listen to Fred from Microsoft. You know, STEM statistics are real. Pipeline issues exist. Uh, where we actually see some of the greatest lags in terms of STEM, uh, entrance is in minority communities, low-income communities, where writing, um, reading and writing takes a lot more precedence over math, science, and technology. We have schools and low-income communities that don't even have 21st century learning centers that places those kids behind. And it's a lot of research that we've done at the Joint Center. We have found by the time a child is in fifth grade, if you've not exposed them to science, technology, or math, the likelihood of them going back into those fields is not going to happen. We know that in this country, a STEM career can actually advance your uh, wage. And we know that the deeper that we go into innovation, the more people that we will need to ensure that we have workers. On the flip side of this, and this is my closing point, we're also in need of a culturally and gender inclusive workforce. At NAMIC, we spent a lot of time with our sister organization, Women in Cable and Telecommunications, focusing on getting more people of color into the industry as decision makers. One of the greatest things about what we're seeing, I think, in our industry, the telecommunications industry broadly, is that multicultural consumers, who, by the way, will make up the majority of population in the next few years, are consuming content, creating content on the YouTubes of this world in an increasingly rapid fashion. You have to bring them to the table, because at the end of the day, they are the consumers for uh, the, the content that we create in our businesses. Other things that we're seeing in the city of Chicago, and I wanted to mention this because I thought this was really cool, Rahm Emanuel, Mary Rahm Emanuel, my old stomping ground, instituted a technology industry diversity council with the sole purpose of diversifying Chicago's technology economy. Here, he's focusing on the percentage of minority employees for tech firms, increasing the percentage of minority owned and operated technology firms, and helping to create a pipeline through the students of Chicago through the public schools as well as the city colleges very all-inclusive way to wrap around these two points that I've mentioned in my last piece. And I want to close on that. You know, when we think about the state of the union as we're talking about the state of the net, President always says in those speeches, these things to form a more perfect union. I don't know, you know, Fred can share what his dad did. I've been walking the streets of Chicago and other places for many, many years, and we still have a long way to go. Our industry, whether you're in cable, you know, telecommunications on the wireless side, the phone side, telephony side, we have a lot to do. 
and as our communities change to be much more real time and advance in our communications protocol. I ask all of you as you go through this conference in any discussion that you're having, whether it's about the rewrite of the Telecom Act, whether it's about cybersecurity and privacy, whether it's about the cloud, are we including everybody in those conversations from the minority to the low income family to the library and the school? Are we making this an inclusive ecosystem to actually progress and maintain the level where we want to be as a nation? And I think that's our selling point. That's our tipping point as we move forward. So I'll end there, but thank you very much for this opportunity to come address all of you uh, during the conference.